My name is Grant Kramer, and I am a professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. Do you like my virtual background? This is a fantastic photo that I've taken at the Vivanco Winery in Rioja, Spain. This is an incredible place. In my opinion, it has the best grape and wine museum in the world. In each upcoming video, I will continue to use some of my personal travel photos as my virtual background. I'd like to give you a little bit of my philosophy and scientific background so that you can better understand where I'm coming from as I teach in the upcoming videos about viticulture and enology. As a scientist and a human being, I'm interested in the truth and nothing but the truth. There have been three major influences in my life. They are science, travel, and my children. I choose to use the scientific method to get closer to the truth and to better predict our world. That is to make observations, form a hypothesis from these observations, test that hypothesis with well-designed experiments and, and to form new hypotheses based upon those new observations. It's an iterative process. This method leads to human progress and a better understanding of the world around us. Travel has impacted me since I started traveling at the age of 19. At that time, I was interested in exploring other cultures and customs. I've traveled to more than 30 countries during my lifetime, many of them associated with great conferences, visiting vineyards, and the local wineries. I've been to most of the major vineyard areas of the world. Along the way, I've asked many questions, and I've learned a lot. It turns out by sheer chance that I lived abroad in another country for about a year, about every 10 years of my life since then. This has been a great cultural experience that I recommend to everyone. It started in 1975 to 1976 when I traveled to Europe and then on to Israel to discover what a kibbutz was like. There I work in the agricultural fields such as the bananas, avocados, and oranges. Ten years later in 1986, after I finished my PhD, I spent a year conducting research in India on the salt tolerance of rice. In 1996, after I became a professor, I took my first sabbatical in Russell Jones's lab at UC Berkeley, and then on to run on Lunds's lab in Canberra, Australia at the CSIRO. That was an incredibly stimulating time investigating the mechanisms of salt tolerance. Following that, I took my second sabbatical in 2006 and studied in Steve Tyerman's lab in Adelaide, in the heart of the wine country, which has five important wine regions in the area. It was a great place to be and learn about great research in Australia. And then finally, in 2016, I took my third sabbatical in Bordeaux with Serge Del Rowe, and Greg Gambetta at the Institute of Sciences of Vines and Wines in Bordeaux. In my opinion, the world's leading institute for great research and wine analysis. That was also a great experience, not only to learn about grapes and wine in Bordeaux, but in other regions all over Europe. Finally, my children have taught me so much. When I was a young adult, I had a belief that the environment largely controlled human behavior, behavior that was based on the fact that my father was a psychiatrist and that in my psychology classes behavior theory was the leading theme. I had the belief as a young father that the environment was what influenced and impacted children the most. So I tried to raise my children in the same way, in their same way for both of them, neutral without bias or any male or female bias. Nevertheless, my children express their individuality and uniqueness. They are quite different. And I am convinced that genetics are more of an influence on behavior and personality than the environment is.
Studies of twins, particularly those that have been separated at birth, convincingly support this hypothesis. These observations are consistent with my understanding of plant biology and grape physiology, that genetics are more important than environment. This isn't to say that the environment is not important or influential. Okay, let's switch to my scientific career and how my history has led me to who I am today. I'm making this channel because I am tending to retire this coming June in 2021 after 33 years of being a professor at UNR. I've published over 100 peer-reviewed scientific journals since I got my master's degree. During the first third of my career, I studied and published papers on the salt tolerance of plants and the mechanisms of plant growth. In the latter two thirds of my career, I focused on grapes and the stress physiology of grapes, in particular drought and salinity. Besides plant physiology, I've utilized a systems biology approach to grapes to get a better, more holistic view of stress responses in grapes. If you're interested, you can find my papers on, our, on, on Google Scholar, on our website at UNR, or in ResearchGate. Let's step back for a moment to the beginning of my scientific career. I graduated in 1973 from Clayton Valley High School in Concord, California in the East Bay area of San Francisco. I started university in the Redwoods at Humboldt State University in Arcata, California, in Northern California, to study forestry. I was a bit naive because I wanted to be a park ranger, having no idea that forestry was much more about chopping trees down. I became a bit disillusioned about the forestry program and became much more interested in my botany classes. After two years, I decided to go visit my uncle's organic farm for the summer in the middle of Massachusetts. I was intrigued by the gardening and agriculture that I experienced there. That fall, I went to Europe because I wanted to explore the world before I returned to finish my degree back at Humboldt, only to never return to Humboldt State. That trip, the first time to live abroad for a year, forever changed my life. I ended up in Northern Israel near Naharia and lived and worked on a kibbutz and later worked on a moshav for the rest of that year. It was my first real exposure to commercial agriculture and the new innovative techniques that the Israelis were using such as drip irrigation and plastic, plastic tunnels to produce earlier ripening tomatoes for the lucrative European market. After that year, I returned to Massachusetts and eventually took a continuing ed course on organic gardening and farming from Don Maynard and Alan Barker, who were both professors at UMass Amherst. I was interested in understanding the differences between organic and inorganic fertilizers. Why was one more important than another? I didn't have enough of a science background to fully understand everything. This stimulated me greatly and I went on to enter into the plant and soil science program, finishing my bachelor's degree in 1980 in the plant and soil science department. Don Maynard was a big influence on me. He was a plant nutritionist and he had close connections to another mineral nutritionist, Oscar Lorenz, in the Department of Veg Crops at UC Davis. He encouraged me to apply to the master's program there to study under Dr. Lorenz. Once I got there, I found out that Dr. Lorenz was retiring that year. So I ended up studying with Dr. Art Spur in the same department, who was an electron microscopist. He was interested in measuring mineral elements with X-ray microscopy. He was quite famous for inventing Spur's resin a very important method for fixing materials for electron microscopy. 
He convinced me that the study of salt tolerance of lettuce, which I knew nothing about, was indeed a study of the mineral nutrition of plants. Since he was paying me, I was willing and I started in on my career on salinity. He had me review the literature. I was heavily influenced by the 1980 annual review of plant physiology article by Rana Munns and Hank Greenway on the, on the mechanisms of salt tolerance and non halophytes That was, and in my opinion still is, the best review of the salt tolerance of plants. I finished that degree in 1982, and in the course of studying, I took a class in environmental stress physiology from Dr. Andre Loikley. I was so enamored with the course materials and Dr. Loikley himself that I became his first PhD student in plant physiology at UC Davis. This was a wonderful time at UC Davis. It was a very stimulating and wonderful time as a graduate student because there were over 120 plant physiologists on campus being in the laboratory also of the of Dr. Epstein and likely in the laboratory of mineral nutrition was one of the best which was one of the best in the world was really really um, exciting in addition we had excellent scientists from all over the world coming to give lectures I had great instructors as well. There were excellent scientists such as Ted Chow and Bill Lucas who heavily influenced my plant physiology education and training. I got the very best of education there. I continued on until 1985 when I finished my degree on the salt tolerance of cotton. I went on to continue some of my work there on a grant I wrote that was supported by the National Science Foundation. I should stop for a moment and acknowledge I'm very appreciative of the funds over the years that I've gotten from not only the National Science Foundation, but from the USDA and, uh, and the University of Nevada, Reno. Without those funds, I would not have been able to accomplish uh, the work I've done over my career. So I'm very appreciative of that. After that, I received a scholarship to take my laboratory experience and put it into it to the test in the field in India for a year in 1986. There I studied the salt tolerance of rice in the fields of Kerala in southern India, studying Pokali cultivation. This was a time when very few people knew outside of that local region about Pokali rice, although now it is well recognized as one of the most salt tolerant rice varieties in the world. It is used in breeding programs all over the world. After that, I returned to Davis and eventually started my position as an assistant professor in the plant science department at UNR in 1988. Most of my research up to this point was focused on the salt tolerance of plants and understanding the mechanisms of growth in terms of cell expansion and whole plant growth. I made great progress in understanding how salinity was impacting and inhibiting plant growth. However, in 1995, that research was becoming harder and harder to fund because molecular biology had become a very important new tool as part of the science of that time. I was not trained in that area of research, but trained only in plant physiology. And my reductionist approach was no longer getting funded but there was, later on, shortly after, a new field developing called, called systems biology. That started to grab my attention because it took a similar philosophy to my interest in whole plant physiology. I was trained to be a whole plant physiologist. Systems biology is a holistic molecular approach to understanding the system interactions of transcripts, proteins, and metabolites. From this time onwards, I focused my research using a systems biology approach. Okay, skip back for a moment, back to 1995. I met a guy named Rick Halbardier, who was interested in growing grapes in the Reno area. I thought this was a crazy idea because I thought it was way too cold 
and grapes wouldn't grow here. He was working with a cooperative extension agent named Wayne Johnson, who had experience with table grapes in our Department of Plant Science. That's the department I was hired in. I decided to get superficially involved because uh, I was sort of intrigued and interested, but really didn't think it was going to succeed. Nevertheless, I helped design and get our experimental vineyard started in 1995. Other influences that led me to get interested in grapes were the fact that my mother and stepfather have been growing Chardonnay grapes, about three and a half acres, commercially in the Carneros Appalachian in Sonoma County. In 1990, there was also another influence on me, which was the 60 Minutes story called The French Paradox, which discussed the beneficial effects of red wine on human health. So for these reasons, I started to drink a bit more wine. I was drinking not very much at that time, maybe once a week, to almost a daily basis so that I could improve my heart health. As I became more interested, I continued to study about grapes and wine research. After about three years or so of research at the experimental vineyard, it was apparent that grapes were surviving in our area. This was rather exciting. And at this point, I got more involved and eventually took over the project. In 1999, I started an experimental winery so that we could evaluate the 12 varieties of grapes that we had planted. And then finally, in 2002, I was lucky enough to receive an NSF plant genome grant for $3.8 million to understand great stress physiology using a systems biology approach. That really gave a boost to my research program. I have to thank my co-PIs on that project who helped me get the project started. Doctors John Cushman and David Schooley, both who were in my department, which I had moved to, which was the Department of Biochemistry. Okay, so that's it for today. I wanna to thank you for your attention. That was a bit longer than I expected, but before I go, I want to tell you that the next video is the first in a series of educational videos on viticulture in Northern Nevada. I hope you find them useful and please enjoy a glass of wine on me. Thank you.